This morning, Reardon had gone to his office, as usual, even though the rest of the office building was closed. At lunchtime, he had stopped at the rolling mills and had been astonished to find the wet nurse standing there, alone in a corner, ignored by everybody, watching the work with an air of childish enjoyment. What are you doing here today? Reardon had asked. Don't you know it's a holiday? Oh, I let the girls off, but I just came in to finish some business. What business? Oh, letters and... Oh, hell, I signed three letters and sharpened my pencils. I know I didn't have to do it today, but I had nothing to do at home, and... I get lonesome away from this place. Don't you have any family? No, not to speak of. What about you, Mr. Reardon? Don't you have any? I guess. Not to speak of. I like this place. I like to hang around. You know, Mr. Reardon, what I studied to be was a metallurgist. Walking away, Reardon had turned to glance back and had caught the wet nurse looking after him as a boy would look at the hero of his childhood's favorite adventure story. God help the poor little bastard, he had thought. God help them all, he thought, driving through the dark streets of a small town, borrowing, in contemptuous pity, the words of their belief, which he had never shared. He saw newspapers displayed on metal stands, with the black letters of headlines screaming to empty corners, Railroad Disaster. He had heard the news on the radio that afternoon. There had been a wreck on the main line of Taggart Transcontinental near Rockland, Wyoming. A split rail had sent a freight train crashing over the edge of a canyon. Wrecks on the Taggart main line were becoming more frequent. The track was wearing out. The track which, less than eighteen months ago, Dagny was planning to rebuild, promising him a journey from coast to coast on his own metal. She had spent a year picking worn rail from abandoned branches to patch the rail of the main line. She had spent months fighting the men of Jim's board of directors, who said that the national emergency was only temporary, and a track that had lasted for ten years could well last for another winter until spring, when conditions would improve, as Mr. Wesley Mooch had promised. Three weeks ago she had made them authorize the purchase of 60,000 tons of new rail. It could do no more than make a few patches across the continent in the worst divisions. But it was all she had been able to obtain from them. She had had to wrench the money out of men deaf with panic. The freight revenues were falling at such a rate that the men of the board had begun to tremble, staring at Jim's idea of the most prosperous year in Taggart history. She had had to order steel rail. There was no hope of obtaining an emergency need permission to buy Reardon metal, and no time to beg for it. Reardon looked away from the headlines to the glow at the edge of the sky, which was the city of New York far ahead. His hands tightened on the wheel a little. It was half-past nine when he reached the city. Dagny's apartment was dark when he let himself in with his key. He picked up the telephone and called her office. Her own voice answered. Dagger Transcontinental. Don't you know it's a holiday? he asked. Hello, Hank. Railroads have no holidays. Where are you calling from? Your place. I'll be through in another half hour. It's all right. Stay there. I'll come for you. The anteroom of her office was dark when he entered, except for the lighted glass cubby hole of Eddie Willers. Eddie was closing his desk, getting ready to leave. He looked at Reardon in puzzled astonishment. Good evening, Eddie. What is it that keeps you people so busy? The Rockland wreck? Eddie sighed. Yes, Mr. Reardon. That's what I want to see Dagny about. About your rail. She's still here. He started toward her door, when Eddie called after him hesitantly. Mr. Reardon? He stopped. Yes? I wanted to say, because tomorrow is your trial, and whatever they do to you is supposed to be in the name of all the people, I just wanted to say that I that it won't be in my name, even if there's nothing I can do about it except to tell you, even if I know that that doesn't mean anything. It means much more than you suspect. Perhaps more than any of us suspect. Thanks, Eddie. Dagny glanced up from her desk when Reardon entered her office. He saw her watching him as he approached, and he saw the look of weariness disappearing from her eyes. He sat down on the edge of the desk. She leaned back, brushing a strand of hair off her face. 
her shoulders relaxing under her thin white blouse. Dagny, there's something I want to tell you about the rail that you ordered. I want you to know this tonight. She was watching him attentively. The expression of his face pulled hers into the same look of quietly solemn tension. I'm supposed to deliver to Tiger Transcontinental on February 15th. Sixty thousand tons of rail, which is to give you three hundred miles of track. You will receive for the same sum of money. Eighty thousand tons of rail, which will give you five hundred miles of track. You know what material is cheaper and lighter than steel? Your rail will not be steel. It will be reared in metal. Don't argue, object, or agree. I'm not asking for your consent. You are not supposed to consent or to know anything about it. I am doing this, and I alone will be responsible. We will work it out so that those on your staff who will know that you've ordered steel won't know that you've received Reardon metal, and those who will know that you've received Reardon metal won't know that you had no permit to buy it. We will tangle the bookkeeping in such a way that if the thing should ever blow up, nobody will be able to pin anything on anybody except on me. They might suspect that I bribed someone on your staff, or they might suspect that you were in on it, but they won't be able to prove it. I want you to give me your word that you will never admit it, no matter what happens. It's my metal. And if there are any chances to take, it's I who will take them. I have been planning this from the day I received your order. I've ordered the copper for it from a source which will not betray me. I did not intend to tell you about it till later, but I changed my mind. I want you to know it tonight, because I'm going on trial tomorrow for the same kind of crime. She had listened without moving. At his last sentence he saw a faint contraction of her cheeks and lips. It was not quite a smile but it gave him her whole answer. Pain, admiration, understanding. Then he saw her eyes becoming softer, more painfully, dangerously alive. He took a wrist as if the tight grasp of his fingers and the severity of his glance were to give her the support she needed, and he said sternly, Don't thank me. This is not a favor. I'm doing it in order to be able to bear my work, or else I'll break like Ken Daniker. She whispered, All right, Hank, I won't thank you. The tone of her voice and the look of her eyes making it a lie by the time it was uttered. He smiled. Give me the word I asked. She inclined her head. I give you my word. He released her wrist. She added, not raising her head, The only thing I'll say is that if they sentence you to jail tomorrow... I'll quit, without waiting for any destroyer to prompt me. You won't. And I don't think they'll sentence me to jail. I think they'll let me off very lightly. I have a hypothesis about it. I'll explain it to you afterwards when I put it to the test. What hypothesis? Who is John Gold? He smiled and stood up. That's all. We won't talk any further about my trial tonight. You don't happen to have anything to drink in your office, have you? No, but I think my traffic manager has some sort of a bar on one shelf of his filing closet. Do you think you could steal a drink for me if he doesn't have it locked? I'll try. He stood looking at the portrait of Nat Taggart on the wall of her office, the portrait of a young man with a lifted head, until she returned bringing a bottle of brandy and two glasses. He filled the glasses in silence. You know, Dagny, Thanksgiving was a holiday established by productive people, to celebrate the success of their work. The movement of his arm as he raised his glass went from the portrait to her, to himself, to the buildings of the city beyond the window. For a month in advance, the people who filled the courtroom had been told by the press that they would see the man who was a greedy enemy of society. But they had come to see the man who had invented Reardon metal. He stood up when the judges called upon him to do so. He wore a gray suit, he had pale blue eyes and blonde hair. It was not the colors that made his figure seem icily implacable. It was the fact that the suit had an expensive simplicity seldom flaunted these days, that it belonged in the sternly luxurious office of a rich corporation, that his bearing came from a civilized era and clashed with the place around him. The crowd knew from the newspapers that he represented the evil of ruthless wealth, and, as they praised the virtue of chastity, then ran to see any movie that displayed a half-naked female on its posters, so they came to see him. 
Evil, at least, did not have the stale hopelessness of a bromide which none believed and none dared to challenge. They looked at him without admiration. Admiration was a feeling they had lost the capacity to experience long ago. They looked with curiosity, and a dim sense of defiance against those who had told them that it was their duty to hate him.